Well, here we are in a series, and the series um, that was um, directed by the session uh, has, is that I deal with the matter of progressive Christianity. So in praying about it, I thought the best way to do it is to put it in contrast, because I do think it is contrastive uh, with historic biblical Christianity and contemporary pro uh, progressive Christianity. I think it's very important to understand that. Let me just kind of put it a little bit in context for us in this, our fourth study in this uh, topical expository series. Um, let me put it in this context. Out in the broader culture, there is the progressive secular humanist movement that you're feeling in entertainment and corporations and the academy and all of that that's going on. Now, one of the things that the Bible warns us about is that what happens in the larger c culture and begins to move, that Satan has a way of taking the professing church and co-opting it so that it becomes a handmaiden of the culture. You see that in the book of Revelation when you see the, uh, the beast of the sea, which is the tyrancy of government and culture, and then the beast of the land that looks like the church, but actually is doing the work of the dragon also uh, in terms of supporting that beast of the land. So the fact that we have had and do have for 2,000 years now, Satan's attacks of infiltration, imitation, and intimidation upon the church to co-opt her or silence her or marginalize her is not surprising. So with the progressive secular humanist movement in the culture, now has risen in the last 20 to 30 years this progressive um, this progressive Christianity, uh, and I have asked people to go back to the 19th and 20th century and see what happened with what was called liberal Christianity and where it led to, and out of that, I've recommended a book, J. Gresham Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism, for which I've been roundly criticized for doing, because the criticism is basically this, Harry, you in, in, um, in liberal theology, there is the denial of the virgin birth, there is the denial of the de deity of Christ, there is the denial of the inerrancy of the word, there is the denial of the miracles. No progressive Christians in the evangelical world are even those who are promoters and supporters of progressive Christianity to some degree within the PCA itself. None of them are promoting such theological apostasy. And I would agree with them. They're not yet. But then again, maybe they are. And hopefully you'll see what I mean by that tonight. But I know they will because progressive Christianity is liberal Christianity 2.0. Why? Because it has the same roadmap. Liberal Christianity did not start out in order to establish theological adulteration, confessional abandonment, and theological apostasy. No, it was a movement in the 19th century. It was a movement that had this motivation. We are going to save Christianity from the dustbin of history. The modern mind is going to dismiss Christianity, so we want to make sure that Christianity is not culturally irrelevant. It must be culturally relevant. And therefore, the motivation was to save Christianity into cultural relevance. Well, that motivation then led to a rethinking of the mission of the church. And at the turn of the century, with all of the technology and the things that were moving, there was this amazing movement within the Protestant, mainline Protestant denominations. This is our opportunity to establish the post-millennial uh, utopia kingdom. Uh, to the, that uh, that's going to be, and the mainline Protestant church is what's going to bring that home. But to bring that home and our mission of cultural transformation and human flourishing to be successive, we have got to make sure that we're not irrelevant. So with the, with the, with the motivation of cultural relevance 
and the new mission of cultural transformation, then what happens is what we are warned in Scripture and see in church history, whatever becomes the functional motivation and the functional mission of a church will inevitably define its mission. So, I'm, I'm sorry, will inevitably define its message and, and edit its confession. So to be culturally relevant to the modern mind, we can't hold on to these doctrines that contain the supernatural. Why, well, that's just, um, how can you be so foolish to believe things like an incarnation, the exclusivity of Christ for salvation? How can you possibly believe those things? And so with the motivation to be culturally relevant and to want to be a culture player, the primary culture player for cultural transformation, it was a short moment to change the message by cultural accommodation. Thus the birth of the, they didn't start out with theological liberalism that led to liberal Christianity. You started with liberal Christianity with its motivation and its mission, and that's what led to the adulteration and the apostasy of the message. Well, it is my contention that on the one hand, you're right. Nobody in progressive Christianity is saying deny the deity of Christ or deny the inerrancy of God's word. Uh, but, uh, and nobody is saying deny the miracles yet. But what they are saying is we've got to be culturally relevant. We're going to lose our children. We're going to lose the students. We're going to lose the next generation. We're going to be relegated to the dustbin of history. We've got to be culturally relevant. Therefore, we need to seek the welfare of the city, not as the Bible says, seek the welfare of the city, but as the city says to seek its welfare. And we know instead of using the tools of the Bible, we'll use the tools of the culture. So instead of biblical justice, we go to social justice. You see, folks, whatever becomes the mission and the motivation will control the message. And so what we have in progressive Christianity is the same motivation and the same mission as liberal Christianity. And now you're going to get progressive theology. And it's already going at the doctrines of first order. It's already tracking down, not the doctrine of biblical inerrancy, but the doctrine of the supremacy and sufficiency of Scripture. Now you have the practical canonization of extra-biblical literature that is rooted out of, counter, out of cultural philosophies that are anti-Christian, anti-gospel, anti-God, and those are now, we're being told, oh, just chew the meat and spit out the bones. But the reality is, it's like a thirsty man on, this, on the ocean try, thinking he can drink the seawater and spit out the salt. It'll kill you. It will adulterate the message. And as I'm going to try to show you tonight, it will also allow movements that deny the gospel. Now listen, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of God's word, the doctrine of the incarnation, the exclusion, all of those things that theological liberalism attacked, not all of them are being attacked now. But that does not mean that doctrines of first order are not being attacked. The doctrine of the supremacy and sufficiency of Scripture, sola scriptura, the Scripture alone is our only rule of faith and practice. That which, that basic doctrine for the Reformation has been eviscerated and is being eviscerated as other instruments take precedence over the gospel dynamics. For instance, well, for there, there are a number of areas, and I'll try to show you a couple of them tonight. And then most of all, well, not most of all, but also related to that, is the denial of the first order of the gospel. Now we have a half gospel dealing with the sins that are found in the culture that the culture is celebrating. You are in the midst of a cultural revolution. But the reality is, we are not in a culture war. We are in a spiritual war. The culture will either be blessed by us fighting the spiritual war with the armor of God and the weapons of the Spirit, or the culture will become the casualty. But it's not a culture war. 
It is a spiritual war. One of the sacraments of rebellion against God throughout society is the cultural embrace of sexual promiscuity, sexual perversion, and sexual anarchy, and all of its attendant deprivations and degradations. Romans 1 paints the picture that when men and women deny the truth of who God is as creator, then they will attack. You see, you've got the creator and you've got his creation. That's a binary. And when God creates, what do you see? Binary after binary. Light, darkness. Land, sea. Male, female. God reflects the binary of the creator and the creation. God reflects that in the very creation itself. And so what is the place of the pointed attack? It is marriage, family, and foundationally sexuality. And what does God do if they exchange the truth of God for a lie? If they worship the creation instead of the creator? That declaration of forensic judgment, God gives them over. He gives them over in Romans 1 to sexual promiscuity with all of its penalties and destruction. Then he gives them over to sexual perversion. Then he gives them over to social approval. Have you ever noticed there's nothing more evangelistic than those who embrace sin? You want to recruit others into you, into it, and you want the society to approve that which is evil and call it good, and that which is good and call it evil. And the sacrament of rebellion against God is sexual immorality, promiscuity, and perversion. And that creates a culture of insanity a culture of absurdity, a culture of immorality. That's why when God called his people out, this deserves so much more treatment, but I'll just give it to you. As God displays the downgrade and the death spiral of a culture, as God displays that in Romans 1, he's already alerted it to you. You remember when God brought his people out and he took them to the promised land? Y'all remember that? He gave them the first books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I know in your reading through the Bible in a year, you start slipping through Numbers and Leviticus, but don't do it. In fact, read in detail chapters 18 and 19 when God begins to list the culture of the surrounding nations and their downgrade and death spiral bestiality, molech, child sacrifice, homosexuality, effeminacy. And then he tells his people, do not let that which is embraced by them ever be named among you. Don't let that culture press you into its mold. Let me use New Testament language but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove that which is good and excellent. Don't be pressed into their mold. And then he says this, if you do, I, like a feather, will tickle the throat of the land and will vomit you out. New Testament language is this, I'll remove the lampstand. I will tickle the land and vomit you out. Did that happen? Did Israel embrace sexual immorality, sexual promiscuity? Did they embrace Molech and child sacrifice? Yes. You want to know what happened? Assyrian captivity. You want to know what happened? Babylonian captivity. God tickled the throat of the land to vomit them out. So here is the fact that here is a culture in a cultural revolution our warfare is not the culture. Ours is understanding. The heart of the problem is the problem with the heart that men and women are suppressing truth and unrighteousness. So we have a spiritual warfare, and we have a mission and message and ministry from the Lord, and our motivation is to love the Lord and love the lost. 
Our motivation isn't to make us culturally relevant. There's nothing more culturally relevant than the gospel of Jesus Christ and the saving power of Christ. And what we need, we don't need a new mission. We just need to do the mission, make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And we need to stay on uh, with the right motivations on mission and on message and in the ministries of the gospel is what we need to do. And the culture will be blessed if we do that, not because we tried to transform the culture, but because we moved to transform sinners with the power of the gospel. And when they get saved, they get changed. And when they get changed, the culture becomes blessed. It becomes the beneficiary. If we don't stay on mission and on message, then the culture will be the casualty, one of the casualties. That's why it's so crucial to understand this. So now, with progressive Christianity, here's our motivation, culturally relevant. Here is our, here is our mission, cultural transformation. And here is the culture in a, in a, um, in a sexual revolution telling the church you this is a true revolution you eat and nobody's looking for a seat at the table for sexual sins now here is the revolution you must celebrate what you once condemned and you must condemn what you once celebrated gender marriage sex within marriage one man one woman one life we're not asking you to tolerate us. We're telling you, you change it or you will be dismissed. And so progressive Christianity buckles down and under that threat and says, well, why don't we make this adjustment and this adjustment and this adjustment? And so as the issues are raised, the sexual revolution, racism, do they look to the Bible for the mission, for the message to fulfill the message, mission? Or do they look to the culture for the tools? And the culture begins to direct us. And that's exactly what happened in 2018 with clarity. In a PCA church, Memorial Presbyterian, in a PCA church, a conference was established called Revoice. And that conference was focused about, in that time, it was how the church can minister to Christian sexual minorities, specifically with the focus upon homosexuality. Now, let me be, let me be clear. This was not a PCA ministry but it was hosted in a PCA church. It was not um, originated by PCA leadership, but PCA leadership did receive, did support, did participate. So it caught our attention. And many of us, and I count myself as one, there was a, okay, let's take a look at this. Now, why was it that we would take a look at it? Well, we took a look at it because, number one, is this going to give us some instruments and some help in how to reach those who are struggling with, under the addictions of unnatural desires and carrying those desires into practice, is this going to help us reach them? And those that we reach, will it help us know how to minister to them? Let's see what they have to say. And so there was a little bit of a, let's see, some of our own people are engaged in it. There must be something there that we need to look at. Secondly, there was not an immediate rejection and a call to arms because one, we all wanted to reach everybody with the gospel, including those in sexual addictions, both promiscuous heterosexual and that which is disordered homosexual. But the second thing that motivated us to take a look is we had to confess we haven't always done it well. And that there are those who are wanting to come out of homosexuality into Christ and to grow in grace. 
and in many churches, not all, by no, by no means not all, but in some churches, they've been marginalized. They've been segmented. They've been put on the side. I'll never forget what Dr. Schaefer said to us one time. He said, should we preach against drunkenness? Yes. Should we preach against immorality, sexual immorality? Yes. Should we preach against sexual uh, perversion? Yes. But if you won't bring the drunk into your house and be willing to clean up the floor or let the sexually immoral dealing with their sins have a bed and the sheets that you've provided, then you're not really dealing with the sin. You have to address the sin if you love the sinner. And you have to love the sinner to address the sin. And so many of us said, you know, we haven't done as good a job as we could do, good a job as we wanted to do, let's listen. Let's hear what they got to say. And then we began to hear what they had to say. And while I am not going to say that here were wolves in sheep's clothing, because I don't think so in many cases, but here were sheep in wolves' clothing that had, through the progressive Christianity, I want to be relevant, I want to transform the culture. To do that, I need to listen to these things instead of believing the Bible's got the solution and the ministries to apply that solution. There began a reinterpretation of how do you deal with these things. And then, therefore, therefore, the door is open for the deterioration of our confession and our message on an issue of first order, and that is the gospel itself. The very gospel itself. And this is why I keep saying progressive Christianity. Not is it promoting theological liberalism, but it will promote theological progressivism and it will do that because it's got the same motivation and the same mission, and therefore, it will eventually accommodate the present culture in the message. And that will be adulterated message and a apostate message. So, as you begin to deal with it, what is it that they were saying? So let me give you from their website, the Revoice website, the mission and the vision. To support and encourage gay, lesbian, bisexual, and other same-sex attracted Christians, as well as those who love them, so that all in the church might be empowered to live in gospel unity while observing the historic Christian doctrine of marriage and sexuality. So what happens in Revoice is there's the recognition of something out there called Side A, and then something called Side B. Now, Revoice in the present ministry has said no to Side A. Side A says God, that homosexuality is the product of if there is a God, he made us this way. Why would we have chosen it? He made us this way. It's in our DNA. It is, uh, forget what the Bible says about unnatural lust. It is a created lust, that God, a created appetite uh, that God has given to us, and the church has got this thing wrong for thousands of years. So you need to get with it and understand that you need to embrace the LGBTQ agenda. That uh, as they went through it, they, they would have, the side A says, we don't need you to give us the gospel. We need you to change the gospel to understand we don't need the gospel. We don't need to be saved from anything. This is something that ought to be affirmed. Same-sex marriage, same-sex sexuality, same-sex same sex sexual practices. All of those things need to be embraced. You've got it wrong, and now uh, you need to embrace it and make room for it. Then there was side B, and side B would be by professing Christians. Side B says no to side A. This is not a matter of creation. It's a matter of the fall. That the same-sex attraction and all of the other sexually disordered uh, dynamics represented by LGBTQAI+, 
that all of those come from the fall. They are of sin. And as you just heard, we uphold the biblical doctrine of marriage and sexuality. We uphold that. We believe that we ought to say homosexual practice is sin. And we ought to say marriage is to be between a man and a woman for life. And in that, of course, you would applaud side B revoice um, position. And that's what's in their mission statement, that we are to note the words. And by the way, please note the repetition here, to support and encourage. Do you hear some relational disconnect? To support and encourage gay, lesbian, bisexual, and other same-sex attracted Christians, as well as to love them. So that in all the church, so then all the church might be empowered to live in gospel unity, not marginalizing, while observing the historic Christian doctrine of marriage and sexuality. Now, here's the problem, though. Built into that is a grenade that won't allow that. Gospel unity, love, encourage, support, oneness with any and all sinners that are being saved by grace. Yet at the same time, division into sexual minorities where I'm not identified as a Christian. I'm identified by my sins before I profess becoming a Christian. And as soon as you have any other identity but Christ, you have undermined any opportunity for demonstrable unity. We can still extend love. We can still extend encouragement, still extend truth. But you can't get to unity unless Christ is our life. No matter what sins and besetting sins you've come from or still are dealing with, becomes even clearer in their vision statement. Revoice exists because we want to see gay, same-sex attracted people who adhere to historic Christian teaching about marriage and sexuality experience peace and belonging in their local faith communities. But notice, what is their identity? Not Christian, but their same sex or gay or whatever the moniker is, the identifying term, that that is their identity within the church, yet they want to see their um, peace, encouragement, and unity in the church. We envision a unified, faithful, and peaceful church where these individuals are able to grow in holiness and in their knowledge of the Scriptures, knowing that they are of infinite worth and value to their Creator. Praise the Lord. Where transparency about one's orientation and ongoing experience creates enhanced possibilities for local churches to utilize and celebrate the unique opportunities that these individuals have to serve the kingdom of God. Well, every believer has a unique set of gifts and a unique experiences, yes. But the sin culture of our life doesn't bring treasure to the work of the kingdom. It is the redeeming work of grace that brings treasure into the work of the kingdom. And then he ends up saying, the unique, uh, uh, and where these individuals are welcomed into the lives of spiritual families so that all can grow together in their knowledge of God and his kingdom. Well, there is much in that to applaud. There is much in that you feel, that feeling of being disconnected, marginalized, that desire to be, to have community and accepted. Thus, we hear it, but yet, in order to accomplish what the mission and vision says, there are things, there's fly in the ointment that must be addressed. Otherwise, we can't really reach 
we can't really reach the LGBTQ community in general and the homosexual segment of it in particular. And to be able to grow, one comes into the body of Christ dealing with their sins and being supported in dealing with your sins, but your sins are never your identifying mark. We don't come in as racist Christians, though we may have to deal with racism. We don't come in as pornographic Christians, though we may have to deal with the besetting sin of pornography. We don't come in as alcoholic Christians, though we may have. You see, why would you, why would you identify with your sin when you've come to Christ and you're dead to your sins and now you've declared war on them, why would you be named by it? And here's the reason why, is because what's informing revoice is as much or more psycho psychological categories and therapies than the gospel itself. And that's why it has to be dealt with and that's why side B theology can have no place in a faithful church. Reaching homosexuals with a biblical gospel and a biblical ministries and discipleship that's patient, loving, uh, accepting people without having to accept behavior, yes, that can be established. But not an attempt to baptize psychological therapies and psychological categories with biblical terms so that now we're using the same terms but we got a totally different dictionary. It's sociology and psychology and behavior modification. Dare I say here, one of the reasons why we've tried to give a good voice to listen to revoice is because of a certain amount of realization that some of the efforts to help those who are um, captured by besetting sins of sexual immorality, sexual promiscuity, sexual anarchy, and perversion, that some of them have been terribly, terribly anti-Christian, yet they've been administered in the names of Christianity, such as reparative, reparative therapy on homosexuals. Reparative therapy that says, well, what can we do to accomplish behavior modification and some of the most drastic things including shock treatments and other things have been done to quote unquote get rid of your problem not the gospel one whole organization thankfully has folded its tent it had a biblical name and proclaimed itself a biblical organization. And I don't doubt their motivations, but their ministry was totally psychologically engaged and, uh, and was dealing with an issue of the heart as if it was simply a matter of behavior modification of your children to do better manners at the table. And then things that were drastically done that denied the dignity and respect of individuals. So yes, we listen, but as you listen, here are the problems with side B, side B theology of revoice. And they, and they render for all of its stated good, uh, for all of its stated good mission and vision, and for the realization that those who hold to this are under constant assault from the LGBT community because they affirm biblical marriage and that homosexuality practice is a sin. So with, but even with realization of all of that, we've got to deal with the theology of side B. And here are five areas I'll give you that need to be addressed and why it can't find root and roost within the PCA if we really want to reach the sexually disordered and the homosexual community with the gospel. These things cannot be embraced from side B revoice theology. Number one is identification with your sin, sexual minorities, sinful identity. If you got your Bibles, look with me in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God. <clears throat> <clears throat> in chapters 1 through 3, he tells you all the gospel blessings that are yours in Christ. 
Then in chapters 4 through 6, he tells you the gospel life. You live for Christ because of the gospel. In other words, Genesis 1, I mean, Gen Ephesians 1 through 3 tell you who you are by justification and adoption. Genesis, I'm mean, Genesis, why do I keep saying that? Ephesians 4 through 6 tells you how you live in light of those gospel blessings with the gospel life of sanctification. Here's what he says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetous must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or pure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. So let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light of the world. So now what do you do? Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when everything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. So let me just stop there. So what he is saying is this. Here is your life of rebellion against God with your evil uh, desires, your sexual aberrations, and all of those things. What you want to do is eradicate them. Desire, thought, word, and deed. That's your objective. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to eradicate those by God's grace for God's glory. And you're doing it not to be saved. You're doing it because you're saved. Because you're saved, you want to go to war against what's there. Are there some sins that are besetting? Are there some sins that you will fight? Are there some sins that seem to be coming back all the time? Yes, but don't make a peace treaty with them. You kill them. Kill them in thought, word, and deed. Their presence and their besetting and, your be and, the, and the experience of their besetting assault upon you just calls you to get to the weapons of warfare to kill them all the more. Because if you don't kill sin, it will kill your testimony. It'll kill your joy. It will kill your life. So you have to go after it. You have to deal with sin. And if, it's, and if your objective is the sins are not to be named, then why in the world would we name ourselves by the sins? Now, Pastor, are you saying that Christians are going to be sinless? No. I'm just saying I believe the gospel. They can sin less. In fact, I don't ever think you'll be sinless except positionally and legally through Christ's blood and righteousness on this side of eternity. And I don't think you'll ever be where you want to be. But I don't think you will stay where you are. I don't know any Christian that's where they ought to be, but Christians, while they never get to where they want to be, they praise God they're not where they used to be. And they can begin to have victory. Some victories you'll get almost with complete triumph on this side of eternity. Some of them you're going to fight all the way up to the time you get the new body for the new heavens and the new earth in which you won't sin and you won't even be able to sin. You see, there, Adam was created perfect with the ability to sin. When Adam fell, he could sin and only sin even when he did what was good. When you get saved... The power of sin is broken, and you will still sin, but you now have the power not to sin. And when you get to heaven, you won't even be able to sin. So where we are now as a Christian is I've been born again. The power of sin's been broken. Therefore, it need not name me anymore. 
and I don't want it even to be named in my life, so I'm going to war against it. Not to be saved, but because I love my Savior. And I will not be identified why. But you see where that leads us to. The second issue in side B is side B gladly accepts the declarative blessings of the gospel, justification and adoption, but it undermines the transforming blessing, the transforming power of the gospel, regeneration and sanctification. I just read one of my a colleagues in the PCA that deals with this issue, and he says, I have never acted out my same-sex attraction, but my desires and my attractions, and now into the third decade, haven't changed one millimeter. Now, folks, I don't know what that means about the individual, but here's what I know. I believe the Bible gives you not only the ability to say no to the act, but the ability to begin to erode the desires. That you can begin to attack them through the power of the gospel. Why? Because I believe the same gospel promise that when you come to Christ by faith and repentance, that you are declared right. Your sins are wiped away. Your, the righteousness of God is yours. You are now justified, meaning innocent. Condemnation has been removed. I believe in adoption. No longer do I serve Satan as if he's my father. Now God is my father, and I'm in the family of God. I believe those declarative blessings, but the same gospel that gives those declarative declarative blessings effectively is the same gospel that says when you come to Christ, you've been born again. You not only have a new record legally, you've got a new heart experientially. And while sin is still in you, you are no longer in sin under its domain. In other words, when you become a Christian, you have sin remaining, but no longer is it reigning. Now grace reigns in your life. Will you faithfully and perfectly? No, we don't believe in perfectionism. We'll leave that to, to the discussion and debate with our Wesleyan uh, friends. We believe if, the, if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. But if you live under sin, then grace is not with you because grace breaks the power of sin, that regeneration then enables you to a life of sanctification, whereby you put off and put on, put off and put on, put off evil desires, put on the better desires, put off the evil, the old man, put on the new man. Now the rest of your life, and it will be an uneven sanctification. It'll be up, it'll be down, you'll get detoured, you'll get back on practice. Who did I preach about today? Was David sinless, the great David? Absolutely not. But the man who had great sins also had great repentance and great growth by the grace of God. And that's what God's grace does for you. In other words, now here's what it is. Revoice theology says, now listen to me carefully. I'm quoting. My homosexual desires are of sin, but they are not sin. It is only the practice of them that is sin. So, if I commit to being celibate, then I am mortifying the sin of homosexuality. You're mortifying the actual sin, but not the thought sin. And the Bible says you've got an old man in you that's more powerful than you. But God's grace fixing you on Jesus can kill that old man every day. That's what can happen. Sin is not a syndrome to be managed. Sin is sin to be killed in thought, word, and deed. Every day you go to war against it. To put off and put on. So we have 
sex, you don't, you're not named by the sin. We're not a sexual minority. We don't call ourselves gay Christians, same-sex attracted Christians. If that's what we've been, even, even more than, even if anybody else is saved, they're not named by their notorious sins. You name Christ and Christ names you. And now you are, are living to kill sin so that even the sin's not named among you, much less you would be named by that sin. Secondly, we don't deny, we don't have a half gospel with just the declarative blessings, but not the transforming power blessings of regeneration and sanctification. Thirdly, thirdly, we don't manage sin. We don't manage sin as if it's a syndrome. We kill it for what it is, our enemy and the enemy of God. The fourth issue is it turned that Revoiced, revoiced theology turns to psychology and sociology more um, uh, ultimately rather than gospel discipleship. Um, I want to ask you to turn to another passage of Scripture with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm sorry, did I say 7? I meant 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm self-editing here and uh, sometimes I get mixed up when I start self-editing. And I've got to self-edit seriously right now. So look with me in 1 Corinthians 6. Familiar text, I've read it before. Go down to verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now what he's talking about is not Christians who are covered with the righteousness of Christ positionally and are attacking unrighteousness in their life, what he is talking about is, are those who are under the governance of their sin. Not those who have sin still living in them, but still living under sin. That the unrighteous will, do, he says what? He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit? See that word inherit, underline it. If he's teaching work salvation, then he would say, he would, he, what he would say, do you not know that the unrighteous will not earn the kingdom of God? He's saying, inherit. You get into the kingdom as a blessing of the death of Christ, and you now inherit your everlasting life. But those who have inherited the everlasting life do not live under the reign of unrighteousness. So he goes on to say, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, those who are dominated by sexual immorality, in other words, not those who are dealing with the besetting remaining sin, but those who are under the reigning sin of sexual immorality, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkard, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, when you inherit the kingdom, kingdom of God and saved by the grace of God, you say no to those sins by the power of God's grace that positions you in the perfections of Christ and now is working on you to mature you for Christ. And here is the fact that those who don't have the presence of regeneration and sanctification cannot lay claim. It does, it's not, oh, well, I've still got sin. No, everybody, we all have sin in our life. We have sin remaining. We've got an old man remaining. Can I try to explain it this way? When you become a Christian, you get a new record. When you become a Christian, you get a new heart. When you become a Christian, you get a new nature. But you still got an old man. And that old man is greater than your new record and your new heart unless you keep the heart fixed on Jesus every day to kill sin and to grow in grace. Therefore, what he is telling us is that the gospel works positionally as well as powerfully. You see, I know this. You see that list of sins? Seven of them were dominating my life when I became a Christian. But when I became a Christian, that's what I was. That's not what I am. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I got a new record, I got a new heart, and I'm growing with my new life. Up, down, unevenly, but I'm growing. Now some of those seven, boom, gone, 
gone, gone, you've heard my talk, gone, microwaved out the day I was converted, just gone. Some of them, I'm still fighting in my life. That's why I got an accountability group. That's why I got prayer warriors. That's why I got encouragement teams. That's why I've got all of that to hold me accountable, to deal with those things. Some of them more powerful than others, but I will not be identified with them, nor will I sign a peace treaty with them, nor will I surrender to them. Why? Because I believe in not only gospel conversion, I believe in gospel discipleship. Now, the besetting sins, they call for more effort, more effort of applying what we call the means of grace. I get sermons dealing with those subjects. I just don't wait for God to pop one up for me. I go get sermons on those subjects. I try to deal with those things. And I realize besetting, you know, some things I can just pull them out and they're gone. Praise God. By grace, let me get in the garden of my life Get this weed out. It's gone. It never comes back. But sometimes I pull it out and I come back in a week and there it is trying to take over my heart again. So that means, you, you know, what I've tried to tell you, you not only have to pull out, you have to push out. Just like some trees, you lower the sap and the leaves fall off. Just don't feed the sin. Feed your life in Christ. Then when the grace sap gets into your life, not only has the old sap been cut off and the sins start to fall away, but the new sap of God's grace just get filled up with God's Word, Lord's Day, preaching, worship, means of grace, fellowship, small group discipleship. Stay in it. Broken vessels can be filled up if you immerse them. Immerse yourself in the means of grace so that you push out those sins. And you get people around you that love you enough that you can share those issues. You're not sharing, oh, I'm a, I'm a same-sex Christian. I'm a pornographic Christian. No, no. I'm a Christian. I'm in Christ. And these things are laying hold of me, and I don't want them to lay hold of me. And I don't look at my sin, my old man, we call it concupiscence. You see, this is a Roman Catholic doctrine. The Reformation supposedly liberated from this. The Roman Catholic doctrine is you got an old man in you that the good that you would do you don't do but you practice the evil that you do and therefore there's nothing you can do about that but if you keep from doing the sin you're okay no we don't believe that we don't believe that it's not it's just the actual sin that sin we think the thought sin the desire sin is sin and we want that's why Jesus said don't just think and don't just keep from committing adultery don't lust in your heart go after it pull it out and one of the best ways is not only to see sin and flee temptation. Don't go stay in that community. Folks, believe me. <laughs> I'm afraid to say, I'm about to say it wrong. Believe me, I had an issue with alcohol. <laughs> I didn't go to those places for years. And I don't, do not hear me say I'm going to them now. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I, have, you, 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 I wouldn't even walk down a street. I was sharing this with Bruce one day on a, on a staff retreat. I, I, can't, I wouldn't even walk down the street where they would open the door and the smell would come out. Flee temptation. Put off the old man. And fill up with something else. I can say no to immorality if Cindy just fills my life up. In Christ and for Christ. And if Christ fills my life up, that those are the ways you go after it. You don't go to psychological therapy, either the reparative theory or the therapy of, um, of celibacy here. I'm fine if you want to be celibate. That's fine. But that's not just the victory. The victory isn't I don't do it. The victory is I want to get rid of the inclinations to it. And now when I get up in the morning, I want to more and more think about Christ that Christ is my life. Finally, uh, there's so much more I, I'm supposed to say and I'm not going to say, uh, but, uh, but finally, the last thing we've got to deal with are those who embrace side B theology. I'm same-sex attracted. I am a same, I'm going to say this, I'm a same-sex erotic attracted man or woman. 
but not because I'm a same-sex phileo guy. I love men who are good friends, brothers in the Lord. But same-sex erotica. But I'm committed to being celibate, and I've been celibate. Does that qualify as above reproach and for ordination in the PCA? Is same-sex erotic attracted above reproach if it embraces, if that person embraces celibacy. You're going to hear people accuse people like me and others of saying, oh, they're, they're, they're raising up a straw man. They're saying that the PCA is about to ordain practicing homosexuality. I never said that. Side A hasn't been talked about in the PCA. Now, I'm always concerned of where it's going to lead to. But what we're dealing with is side B. Is someone same-sex attracted, erotically, but committed to celibacy, are they qualified to be ordained ruling and teaching elders in the PCA? That's the battle that is before us today and what we are dealing with. You see, now may I come back. The reason I want to say all this is not only do I want to make sure that we say no to progressive Christianity And next time we're going to look at critical theory, critical race theory, and all of that. But what's opening the door is a motivation and a mission that thinks we have to be culturally relevant, culturally, culture, and culture transforming. Therefore, we keep modifying the message with the instruments, tools, and messages of, uh, and we culture. You see, we're at first order issues the sufficiency of Scripture, the sufficiency of gospel discipleship, and the sufficiency of the whole gospel of God justification, adoption, regeneration, and sanctification. These are first order issues. Yes, they're not deity of Christ, but they're first. What did Paul say? I delivered to you that which is of first importance, the gospel. You get that wrong, everything else is wrong. These are first order issues. And do we want proponents of this to be ordained in the PCA? You see, I believe with all my heart those who I'm reaching out to in the homosexual community, discipling to now, those who are, uh, those who are, uh, you want to reach with evangelism and you want to reach with discipleship, I don't want to go with them to them with a management therapy. I want to go to them with a gospel that says you can be forgiven of all the shame and guilt and the power can be broken. And I am not promising you're going, to get, you're going to get fixed here completely, but I am promising you God's transforming grace is powerful, just like his forensic grace that declares you right with him. And we can get on a journey because Jesus starts the makeover when Jesus is the takeover. And that's the gospel that I want to say. To my brothers and sisters, I mean, to my brothers in the ministry, I would say this. I'm sorry. We can't keep silent about this. You got to say something. You can't just sidelines and be silent. Now, that doesn't mean just say something and say the wrong thing. Be thoughtful, be careful. Don't just say something because everybody wants you to say something. Say the right thing. But we're going to have to say something from the pulpits. And we must not say the wrong thing. Hear me. While I want, and I've listened to Revoice because I want to increase my effectiveness reaching those who are in sexual disordered sins, both natural, heterosexuality, and also unnatural desires, such as I want to reach them. I want them to be brought in. I want them to be loved. I want them to be cared for. But I'm not going to do it with the tools of the world that manage sin and just keep from stopping. I want to go to the heart of the problem, which is the heart, and the gospel will get there. Therefore, we want to have that kind of discipleship, that trust, 
the blessings of the gospel declared and the blessings of the gospel transforming for the rest of your life. Some of those sins, boom, microwaved. Some of them, crock-potted. That's the way the Lord does it. But we win the victory. And the perfection is eternity. And on the way, we're not named by our sins. We're named by Christ. And we don't manage the sins. We mortify the sins for the glory of Christ who saves us to the uttermost. And I've got to say something. Please hear this because it's just the burden of my heart. We've got to have people of God who with truth and love know how to engage this. I mean, with all due respect, how many of our people are concerned about it? How many of our people? Now, part of it is preachers are either preaching the wrong thing or they're saying, hey, this isn't a big issue. This is just philosophy. This is personality type and stuff like that. But I want our people to know these are first order issues. <laughs> Yet will the people want to know it? Well, look. Where is our heart for Christ's church? That by God's grace, we don't get vomited out. By God's grace, the lamp stands not moved but we'll be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. May God give us carefulness and courage to deal with these issues in our day, to win everyone to Christ who trust Christ and live for Christ and then help them grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Even the besetting sins, we go after not their weeds only, but their root. The gospel is glorious. Father, thank you for the time we could be together. Thank you, Father, to address these uh, issues that just uh, are extraordinarily weighty uh, in life and in ministry. But help us feel the weight of them, not to create worldly anger of man, but, Father, to understand that I can, without loving and accepting sin, or something less than God's solution, which is the whole counsel of God, the gospel. Please. Give us the power of the gospel. Help us to believe, share it, and live it. Thank you, Lord. Live it. Love it. Glory of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.